All right. Well, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, I wanted to kind of explore some things uh, that we have in common and uh, especially our background in Calvinism, I guess, is, is uh -huh. especially of interest to me. Um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, you know, I've heard, I heard you. In fact, it seemed like a pretty recent interview. I'm, I can't recall which. It may have been Grace Saves All, but somewhere where I heard you go into a little more detail about what you went through, you know, in terms yeah. of being in the EPC, I think. <laughs> And uh, I was in the PCA, and uh, but uh, by the way, do, I know this is just out of left field in a way, but also there's at least a chance that you may have known a guy by the name of Austin McCaskill. Yeah, that name doesn't ring a bell. Okay. Uh, so right. well, that's okay. I mean, he 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 was in the EPC. I, I went to seminary. With Austin. Yeah, and uh, but he was in the EPC, and uh, he was a lawyer who basically quit practicing so he could go into ministry. But was a great guy. But that's well, that's been a while ago. You know, it's been yeah thirty plus years or maybe forty. I've got to count it. <laughs> well, yeah, we probably were in the EPC together, but I, you know, I uh, yeah, I wasn't. I didn't get super involved in the bigger denomination uh, right. till I till I got sucked into it. <laughs> right, sure, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, take me back to uh, you know maybe maybe when this when when the doubts began to form, maybe perhaps about your your Calvinism, or I guess you were a five pointer at some point, but yeah. Uh, you know, how, how did, how did you go from there to where you are now, at least in terms of theologically, what's the beginning right. of it? Yeah. So, wow. Where do you jump into the story? <laughs> it might, you know, my dad was a Presbyterian pastor. So he uh, went to Princeton after world war two on the GI bill. And wow. um, so I grew up in the, in the church and that was kind of, was a, the more mainline liberal denomination. So, and, uh, I, I think in, in high school, well, you know, I kind of always, uh, loved the Lord. My dad was just a great guy who yeah. was very Christ-like. And so it was easy to think of God as my, as my father. I mean, the, so, you know, when I think when I was a kid, the idea of sort of endless conscious torment just seemed bizarre to me. So I think I, I sort of learned about that from like my evangelical friends in high school and right. we had a youth pastor that really pulled me back into the gospel and my dad went through something of kind of a reformation at the time so i hmm. so i kind of grew up with sort of in the in the more liberal mainline uh stream of things and yeah. then got excited about the gospel and i think i got i think i got excited about calvinism because when i began to wrestle with the idea that um well that everyone would be judged and that possibly or, or supposedly according to my friends most people would be subject to endless conscious torment and and I was a science geek at the time so I was really into geology and you know I had an idea for how long um how old the earth was mm -hmm. at least according to my view and right. it, that's an interesting topic but mm -hmm. that just seems so absurd to me and i and I, but i was excited about telling people about jesus and so calvinism um felt like absolutely necessary to me because if anybody was going to get endlessly tortured forever i did not want to be responsible for that choice i just mm -hmm. thought how could a person even exist mm. knowing that they screw up the four spiritual laws and the person they're talking to would be endlessly tortured by God? That was so I so the sovereignty in Calvinism was um, a big help to me. I thought, well, God's got to be in charge of salvation. And then, of course, you have the you know, the, you wrestle with the problem of so, well, what kind of God would do that? And my my dad 
um, really like Karl Barth, and I didn't understand all this at the time, but he would right. say to me, well, you can just trust that God is good. Right. And so, you know, that got me a ways. And um, my my dad was removed from his church by for kind of being too evangelical. He was mm -hmm. tried on in a in a church in downtown Denver, publicly tried. Yeah. Later, later, God showed me miraculously that I had kind of gone into the ministry out of hatred for what the church had mm. done to my dad. Yeah. Um. So, but, but then I, but then he was then was part of kind of forming the EPC. He was in on the ground for the EPC. Oh. So, yeah. going from sort of that liberal side, where in my mind as a as a teenager the liberals were the bad ones and the even the conservatives were the good one now we go over to the conservative side and uh god our dad had been god dad had been um Freudian excommunicated <laughs> yeah yeah he was a good presentation of our father in heaven but yeah. dad had been dad had been defrocked for wanting to preach the jesus of scripture you know mm -hmm. so now i'm over here on the right in the evangelical church because i went went out to seminary and worked in some big pcusa churches but then was ordained in the epc and as i'm and i'm preaching expository sermons and now i'm at i went to this small church on the west side of denver that really started to uh grow dramatically and kind of became a flagship church in the epc wow. but i'm preaching these expository sermons and I always, and, and I always, the, the one point of Calvinism that was just really hard to square with scripture was limited atonement. Yep. And then the, and the more I preached, the more I kept coming across these Bible verses that, you know, what I call the Bible verses banned by Bible believing believers <laughs> that, that really said, God's going to pull this thing off. You know, like we're supposed to hope that people get saved and lo and behold, Jesus is the savior and he's actually capable of saving people. Wow. And in my Calvinistic scheme of things, if God uh, chooses a person, chooses to save a person, he's entirely wow. capable of, of doing that. Yeah. And so the more I looked at scripture, I thought, I, I don't know how to explain this away. Mm. Meanwhile, I, we had had some experiences, particularly praying for a friend of ours that was, raised in a in a coven and just saw the craziest things mm -hmm. and what what so i began to experience jesus in a different way too and the judgment of god and the fire of god i began to realize well it's all love and love is like incredibly violent it violates mm -hmm. evil <laughs> so mm -hmm. so evil is evil can't tolerate the presence of love because it it fills it with goodness and d destroys it makes it new so I began to just preaching to preach those messages and I couldn't help it. Meanwhile, my dad died um, and I started getting in trouble and I started reading Karl Barth, you know, thinking about my dad and also mm -hmm. thinking, help me with this. And the more I, you know, read Barth, the more I realized, well, th in, in kind of around the evangelicals, they would explain Barth as the guy that, you know, didn't respect scripture, but I'd read commentaries and I'm thinking all these evangelical commentators, they say they respect scripture, but they just throw it out. They And they have ways of doing it, like, well, common sense dictates, and then coming up with categories that aren't there in the text, but that they invent that are supposed to somehow change things. Yeah. And so I realized, wow, Bart is the one that's, Bart systematizes things, and I, and I, and he's taking scripture more seriously than anyone. Mm -hmm. So all of that led me to a place where the denomination came in and they, ironically, they, they, they started saying, you can't say this stuff. And mm -hmm. I would say what stuff? And they'd say, you know, this stuff. And I knew that I knew this stuff. It was the Bible verses. They, because I was really careful. All I did was quote Bible verses and then didn't explain them away, but I exegeted yeah. them. Right. So they, they ended up putting me on trial and they couldn't figure out where I was being unbiblical. So they made me state my objections to the Westminster Confession. Mm -hmm. And there were two objections they didn't approve. Um, and, and really, I don't even know that these are real objections to the Westminster Confession, but in, in there, cause I, cause they kind of cornered me, but I had to stand up and publicly state that there was a group of people that couldn't be saved. And, and I said, well, how can I say that when the disciples asked Jesus who can be saved? And 
He said, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. So how can you ask me to say it's impossible for this group to be saved? And then the second one was that um, that God took pleasure in damning these people. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's a tough one because it depends on what you mean and what you mean by damning. But, you know, if you mean endless conscious torment and, and scripture says he takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked. So I said, I, I just have trouble saying that because scripture is pretty clear on that. And so they, uh, and then they tried me and excommunicated me defrocked me and it, this was the wild part god showed me wayne sorry this story's going too long no, no, but he showed me uh really miraculously that he was in charge of the whole thing because he had i had been to this conference where he uh, the one time in my life i heard him audibly speak to me mm. and he revealed to me that i had gone in the ministry because i i really hated the church i because i wanted to be a geologist but i got but he, but, but I, um, and it was because I saw my dad tried on the floor of the Denver Presbyterian being kicked out from the left. Yeah. And then I got tried on the floor of the Presbyterian being kicked out from the right. But with both of us, it was because we wanted, um, I think to preach about Jesus, the Jesus of scripture. Yeah. And so, um, Sorry, my son's dog just walked in here, distracted me. We, he he's on a rafting trip to the Grand Canyon and left the dog with us. I forgot we had a dog and something's licking my leg all of a sudden. But anyway, I he got kicked out from the left. I got kicked out from the right, and God showed me miraculously that I'd gone to the ministry really because of my anger at the church for what had happened. Mm. Well, when we started our the sanctuary years ago. We ended up meeting in the very same church where I watched my dad tried, and I hadn't planned this or anticipated this. So oh. God had me stand in that very same spot and 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 preach. So anyway, maybe I'm rambling on too much there, but Calvinism then for me is is beautiful once you take out limited atonement mm -hmm. and people would say peter everything that you're saying is so confusing and hard to understand and i just would get really confused because i go well all it is is four point calvinism and here's the the funny thing when i was in the denomination every time a new pastor would come in you know the the old guys would always question them like well where are you on five point calvinism and invariably they would say, well, I'm a three and a half or a four a pointer. Oh. And I, and I remember just saying to everybody, look, I'm just saying the logical conclusion of all your four point Calvinism. And that's God's going to pull this thing off and to him be the glory. Yes. So, and that just got people angry. So mm -hmm. anyway, there's, mm -hmm. there's a long rambling answer uh, to your question. Uh, hopefully, that's, that's good. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. That that's that's a wonderful story. Uh, when you were when uh, let's say so, just to make clear, before you were actually um, excommunicated and you were preaching in, in the EPC church, you had come. I, I I can imagine that maybe you weren't necessarily labeling or categorizing what you were preaching universalism, but you were just preaching scripture, right? Uh, and which which would be equivalent, basically, with I I like to call it historic Christian universalism. Uh, yeah. Kind of a little bit clarified, but uh, so so you had already pretty much arrived at that position, and and you were sharing that with your congregation. Well, no, really. At the time that I was defrocked and all that stuff, I I was pretty much just ho hoping, um, yeah. asking for permission to hope. And yeah. they so, they said, you know, what I said is I just I think can I just say that I think these Bible verses are true? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you can hope that they're true. You just can't believe it's possible for them to be true. Or or they said you you can hope that God would you know, that as an atom all die, all in Christ will be made alive. You just can't believe that that right. actually means all that yeah. died in Adam. So, you know, just just kind of nuttiness. And yeah. I, I think it, it sort of infuriated them because they kind of didn't know how to to, to work through that. And, the, you know, the, the word universalism has always been hard for me because yeah. growing up, um, 
in, in the circles that I was in, th there are some people who say, well, the last thing you are is a universalist because you say that, you know, the only way to the Father is through the Son and you believe all these Bible verses. Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, so historic first century, second century universalism. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was one of the things I, I was thinking when you when you shared that uh, that that when you know a person was would be examined in view of taking a, a pastorate and within I guess I guess you call it presbytery uh, mm -hmm. is that what you call the larger yeah the, so you yeah the gen, the general assembly is the nationwide body and the presbytery is the more local like the state body yeah and then you would have local sessions. With, yeah uh, mm -hmm. with the elders right yeah so the local church uh, the presbyterian church is really the government's very similar to the united states government that yeah. is the idea right well i was going to say in, in the i don't know if it was true of all presbyterians i i, I kind of think it 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 was at least and probably still is in, in the pca uh if you had said you were a four and a half point Calvinist, you you would not have been able to be a pastor. You know, I mean, you had to be five point all the way. And uh, ironically, I was on the, I forget now what it was called, but it was something like the committee that that really did the doctrinal in investigation of this individual. Right. And I was on that committee to, to ensure doctrinal purity. Right. So. <laughs> well, you know, the, I mean, kind of the, the well, you know the history a little bit. I mean, the PCA left the PCUSA yeah. earlier than the EPC, and I guess the PCUSA was still the t two other big denominations. And so the EPC was kind of the next big group that left. Mm -hmm. So in the e in the EPC, you know, you could have up at the discretion of the local body, you could have uh, w women in ministry. So it was it was sort of like for the pastors that weren't ready to go all the way PCA, but then the EPC really got into wanting to grow. Yeah. And so they started trying to attract PCA pastors. So part of what got me in trouble was that a few years before I was tried, the denomination became subscriptionist to the Westminster Confession, which is insanity because everybody changes the Westminster Confession. <laughs> but then, the, and, the, and so a, a big part of it, this is, you know, this is the ironic thing. When I was tried, they, they, pulled together this committee for me to meet with seminary professors and, all, and the wild thing is they got professors from the Baptist seminary. And I'm thinking, I thought we were Presbyterians. Why are you, why are you, but they, and they didn't know quite what to say to me. And I, and it was an important process for me because I had to come to the realization, wow, the emperor really has no clothes. They don't know how to argue this thing. Right. But when I, when I was tried, you know how press trade works. A lot of the pastors are busy doing their things and they kind of didn't want to be there. They sent their, they sent their elders. Mm -hmm. But I think that really the thing that concerned them was not theology. It was that this doesn't look evangelical. This doesn't fit our scenario. Mm -hmm. And I, that's exactly why I felt like God wanted me not to just go away. Uh, but, and I, I mean, I really couldn't, I couldn't stand up and lie about who I thought Jesus was because I was just realized that's just like opening the door to evil. I can't do that yeah. to myself or my my family. Right. But I also realized that there's something really strange going on here. And that is that the church is offended by the idea that God is salvation, which is of course the name for Jesus. And yeah. how weird is it that preaching that Jesus accomplishes that for which he was sent, that the judgment of God is accomplished in Jesus, that that should offend the church. And I began to realize, well, that's our flesh or the worst, what I call the worship of Mises. It's the, yeah. and, and together in the church, it's the worship of worship of wheezes. And, and then I became aware, gosh, we're the Pharisees. We're the people that crucify uh, Jesus. So the 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 irony I think is that people didn't really want to engage in the theological discourse once they saw what it was because I think something inside of them realized well if God really is the savior I'm not the savior and 
that means I'm not better than my neighbor. I'm mm. everything I have is a gift of grace, yes. which of course is Calvinism right down the line, right? Exactly. It's just that it's just that, it's that ironically at the last minute Calvinism swoops in and finds a way to look down on somebody else. <laughs> and and that and that was I think the thing that was so offensive. So yeah. It was surprising to me how, in the end, how little of it was a sincere theological or exegetical debate. Mm. And it was more sociological and also sort of kind of, well, the, this this just doesn't, this just doesn't fit our culture because yeah. we're into judging our, it, they wouldn't say it this way, sure. but we're into defining ourselves as the good guys and everybody else as the bad guys. And it mm -hmm. sounds like you're messing with that idea. Yeah. Right. Oh, man. Uh, you mentioned um, the Westminster Confession, of course. And, and I, I definitely wanted to ask you, um, uh, have you are are you familiar with or, or have you explored uh, Peter Steary? No, uh -uh. I, I haven't. Uh, he was one of the Westminster divines. Well, I think there were 16 or something like that. Yeah. And it turns out and I found this out through Robin Perry. Uh, oh, did you? Well, yeah. I, you know what? I probably just read about Peter Steary because I just read Robin's book on the history of um universalism you know uh, yeah, the yeah. last uh, joy was it called joy a larger joy part two yeah a larger hope yeah, yeah but larger. that he yes. robin dedicated that book to me and brad really? jersey yeah so robin yeah wow. so actually robin was here at my house a few weeks ago and i hadn't finished the book so i thought well i better finish this book so I think, yeah, Peter Steary was one of the, he probably mentions in the book, but yeah, I don't remember yeah, the details. Yeah. Well, this, it was just fascinating and mind-blowing to discover that one of the Westminster divines was a Calvinist and a Universalist. Well, it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> I mean, that's what, you know, that's what Torrance and Barton, even though Barton, and Torrance and those guys do the weird little gymnastics at yeah. the end, yeah. I go, well, that's what they are. They, you, you know, and that, sure. they they would you know people will use all sorts of words but i go everything in that theology points right in that direction and then yeah. at the end they say well we can't determine doctrine for god or something like that you know that this has yeah. doesn't ha and i go exactly it's revelation that's your yeah. your whole point yeah. so, that's so it, that that there aren't more calvinist universalists is always kind of a shock to me <laughs> yeah i i think in some respects it's the easiest transition to make from from being a Calvinist to being a universalist. But. but yeah, yeah, I do too. So, you know, there are a lot of folks kind of come from that more Arminian background. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of learned to, when people had questions about the whole idea, to early on to say, well, are you coming at this from the Arminian side or the Calvinist side? And if they said the Calvinist side, I said, oh, this is easy. Here, <laughs> <laughs> Right. I don't know. I, I sometimes I have I have one very close friend. Uh, he actually like has a, a Ph.D. in church history from St. Andrews in Scotland. And, and he's a smart guy, but he's so Armenian that, you know, it's, it's like uh, free will is the is the ultimate arbiter of everything for him. You know, you just can't say that God will save everyone because there could be at least one person that's just never gone yeah <laughs> well, and it's you know it's so ironic because you'll get staunch calvinists that jump over to the free will argument at the yeah. drop of a hat and they don't even acknowledge it that's the strange <laughs> thing to me right right yeah i think i think that for me and it seems like even just more recently probably in the last couple of years or so what brought me over into you know the the Christian universalism uh, was, I guess, in, in a larger sense, my view of God uh, and a changing, uh, especially above everything, to, to really facing the fact that God is love. Yeah. And that's how that's irreconcilable with all these other notions. But the other thing recently for me, and again, just in the last few years, is I've consciously come to a different perspective on man, on humanity. I just, I just, uh, even though 
with certain qualifications, I could probably still say I believe in total depravity. Uh, I've just come to see humanity in a different light uh, that to me, scripture really teaches that there is something fundamentally good, very good about humanity and mm -hmm. that the fall has not erased that and that uh, the image of God is is in some respects indelible and it's there and it's in everyone. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's just what. Really well, yeah. So I should. Yeah. When I say that I'm four point, I need to back up to total <laughs> depravity a little bit. Right. So um, I I would definitely agree with what you just said. I, I mean, I but well, here, here's I wrote two books on Genesis that uh -huh. and I want to do a third book. And wow. the, this is the thing that I get really excited about is like once you throw out the idea of God endlessly tormenting people, all of scripture comes together in this wonderful new way. Yeah. And I really think that, you know, the doctrine of salvation is part of the doctrine of creation. So that we're in the process. Well, first of all, creation is, is time is a problem because the way we talk about time in the modern world, there's a very, was an antiquated view of time now uh, because physicists says, you know, time is largely an illusion. So I think the biblical idea is that in, in the truest sense, we're already created in Christ Jesus and seated in the heavenly places and God has accomplished what he set out to do. Hmm. And yet we're somehow experiencing our own creation right now in space and time. Mm. And the, the first book I kind of wrote on that is, is the idea that I think scripture is saying, and the science around this is really pretty fascinating yeah. that we theologically, we really are living in the sixth day of creation mm. and we're dealing with the tree in the middle of the garden, which is the cross, which is how God creates good judgment in his children. Mm. And it's like Paul says in, in Romans that, that Adam was a tupas. He was the imprint of the last Adam. And so each, and each one of us is Adam. So, yeah. you know, it's wild when you get into the anthropology and scripture yes. that, yeah, man is this amazing thing that I'm, that I'm like this, well, I'm, I am this uh, imprint of Jesus and I'm being filled with Jesus, and mm -hmm. I'm actually the body of Jesus, mm -hmm. and so is Wayne, and so are all the people around me, but they're all in various stages of waking up. Right. And I'm totally depraved in the sense that mm -hmm. I can't create myself. So the doctrine in my mind that, and, and the illusion that I can create myself is depravity, it's like mm -hmm. insanity. And yet the very thing that has the illusion is the breath of God, this, mm -hmm this eternal um priceless so so it, of course the problem with endless conscious torment is well if a person is breath of god in dust if that's what a person is then god has to endlessly torture his own breath which just makes n no sense but sure. yeah wake, waking up to the realization that w w i was thinking about th this way too getting ready for christmas when mm -hmm. scripture says that you know, Jesus is the son of man in seminary. I, if you're like me, everybody kind of did backflips trying to figure out why he always referred to him as a self as the son mm -hmm. of man. And I, I'm like, well, if God is his father, that means man is his mother, that he really is born of us. And mm -hmm. like Paul says, he's formed in us. So mm -hmm. I am, but, but who is it? The Anglican guy that said, man is God appearing in the universe. Um, mm -hmm. And you go, there's this amazing glory in mm -hmm. humanity but but the way i think of it is that like that that total depravity is that that tupas or that imprint and it's the, it's the old self it's my ego because my ego my ego keeps telling peter that he can create himself and so my ego compares me to other people is insecure always wants to hide right. and and that that old empty self is an illusion and it gets judged, it gets destroyed, but it gets destroyed by being filled with grace, mm. which is the new man, which takes the form of of the old man, which is the story of my creation, which is my salvation, mm. which is the most logical and simple thing in the universe. If you Well, salvation then becomes profoundly simple, right? Because if 
God is the creator and he creates me and he truly creates me out of nothing but himself. Mm -hmm. Well, my ego is the dumbest illusion I could possibly have because I never, because we all act like we brought chip. The, the problem with the whole way we conceptualize free will, right? Is that we, that we somehow brought chips to the table and we can somehow make bargains with our creator to create ourselves, which you have to go, well, where on earth did you get those chips from? Where did you get the, that, where did you get your value from? Well, you must believe that you on your own are mm. the uncreated creator, mm. which is the illusion that traps you in the, in the darkness. And then the weird irony is, well, I can't make myself God, but God can make me himself. So in seminary, I remember one of at Fuller, we read this book, Deification, the Deification of Man about the idea of theosis, you know, and the, and from the Eastern Orthodox Church, that whole, that whole tradition in Eastern Orthodoxy, that God's in the business of pouring himself into us and deifying himself somehow. And it, it, it's really quite, so shocking so well this is this is what the third book is about i really think the scripture is saying that the cross in the middle of the garden on calvary is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and mm -hmm. when i go to that tree trying to create myself i take knowledge of the good in an effort to justify myself and i crucify the savior Mm -hmm. But when I come back to that tree and I realize that what I have taken has always been given because God is love. Well, I go from the, the very thing that crucified the Christ is now filled with the very blood of Christ, the body of Christ, the mercy of God. And mm -hmm. I become who it is that I truly am. Yeah. And I love as I have been loved. And I have faith because Jesus has faith in me. Yeah. And that's how I enter that's how I go through the pass through the door and I enter into the new creation, mm. which scripture I think pictures as this the seventh day when everything is good and it mm. is finished. So what is what is a man? What is a woman? What is humanity? Well what and what's happening now? Well, we're observing our own creation that we might glorify God forever. So this is back to our Calvinism. Yeah. Right. <laughs> glorify God forever for his grace, which isn't a small thing. It's absolutely everything. And mm. I, I think that's the that's the offense of the cross is that mm. if yeah. God is my creator, Peter is not his own creator. And if I think I'm my own creator, I cannot exist in the unmitigated presence of God because it it devours me, devours my, my illusions. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I had, um, I had just, um, something, it, it was something of an epiphany. Uh, it's probably been about a year ago. Uh, and I think this kind of ties in at least in some way with with what you're sharing uh, that um, it's first Corinthians chapter two I believe it's two uh, I was reading it as I've done you know numerous times over mm -hmm. the years uh, um, and I was I was just shocked and arrested when I, I saw something that I had read all those times but in some respects I'd never seen. Uh, and it, it is where Paul says, you know, when I came among you, determined that I would only preach Christ and him crucified. And my perspective up to that, up, up to that day when this epiphany happened for me was, you know, go get them, Paul. That's, that's right. And, you know, this is what uh -huh. we need to emphasize. This is what we need to preach Christ and him crucified. And of course, I absolutely agree. We must preach Christ and Him crucified. I mean, that's so essential, uh, and and lies in some respects at the very core of the gospel. Obviously, so I'm, it, not to take away from that, although I know it will sound that way. But what hit me was when he said, "But among the mature, I do speak, you know, of a wisdom that has been hidden for the ages." 
uh, and that's in a sense been ordained for our glory. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, the, uh, the our glory part especially was so con contrary in some ways to Calvinism. It's like you're you're preaching a man centered gospel and all that kind yeah. of thing, which I know Pete you can do. I, I understand that. But it's still shocking to, to well, Paul. Paul said Christ in you is the hope of glory, right? And so, and God is glorified in Christ, and Christ is born yes. in in us. And so, it ultimately but, redounds to His glory. Uh, yeah, and that we really are His. So I and I also began to realize the more I wrestle with the text that Paul is talking about all of humanity as Christ's body and all things are going to be anacephalia or unified under the headship yes. of Christ. And so then salvation is really convincing body parts to come back to the body and be reattached. And, right. and if I send someone to endless conscious torment, I'm sending part of my own body to, that's just insanity. Right. So, right. yeah. And I, well, and I, what he says there in first Corinthians two, when he talks about this wisdom, I really think that, that the cross that, that, that the that it's the word of God that's on that tree is huge because that means the cross isn't the way God rescues a, a minority of humanity from endless conscious torment. The, right. the 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 cross is how God creates all things. So mm -hmm. without the cross, nothing exists. Uh, that's the that's the word of love spoken into the void. And you 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 know I the. This is this is something I feel like we've missed. But the thing that's hanging on that tree, if I, if I picture that that the true trees are somehow one tree, which is kind of an ancient discussion, you know, yeah. then the thing that's hanging on the tree is wisdom. So mm -hmm. all wisdom, all truth, it all comes from that tree. Mm -hmm. But how I relate to the tree is the difference between damnation and salvation. So if I relate to wisdom as a thing then I take wisdom and I use it for my own purposes and I justify myself with works of the flesh according to the law because then wisdom is no longer a living being. Wisdom is knowledge of good and evil that I use to judge my neighbor. Yeah. And then the very thing that was life now brings death to me. But when I surrender to wisdom as my Lord, well, then I am I know wisdom in a new way because I'm known by wisdom. Yes. who is also my husband, mm -hmm. who enters into a communion with me and bears fruit in me yeah. as his bride. And the fruit is this new humanity that is me and my neighbor. And so I I think that that tree in the middle of the garden is really a picture of how we relate to everything in the depths of our heart because the, the garden then you know, gets picked up in the temple, the cherubim guard the way to the throne, and then the temple becomes Christ's body. And then lo and behold, we become Christ's body. Mm. And that tree is like the judgment seat at the center of reality. And also this, and, and then and Julian of Norwich in her vision pictures a lot of this stuff, how somehow mm. God you, rules the universe from the depths of the human heart, which is a crazy idea because that means that that one day when I walk in faith with God, I I have this, this freedom that is God's very freedom that we will speak reality into existence because I will be in communion with my father. That's right. yeah, the, pro the promise. So all that to say what you're saying, Wayne, is so cool because, yeah, the promises for humanity, who we truly are, is utterly shocking. It's mm. It's beyond anything that, you know, we try to dream it up on our own and right. end up in outer darkness. Yeah. But when dad does it for us, there you can't even imagine anything bigger or better. <laughs> That's true. That's so true. So now yeah. where you were in the, how long were you in the PCA and how did you end up moving on from that? Uh, I was in the PCA probably, let's see, probably about 12 or 13 years. I was raised, also by a pastor, and my dad was a Southern Baptist pastor, and uh, I came to I came to faith at nine years old under a hellfire brimstone sermon 
which my oh. dad was was uh, pretty good at. And uh, um, I don't, I mean, you're probably not really familiar with the just kind of the culture and the, the sensibilities of the Southern Baptists, especially if you're in the South. But uh, but anyway, but my dad was a wonderful man, a great man, strong-willed man, and a great great mm-hmm. leader. Uh, World War II vet and all this stuff, you know, D Day. But uh, um, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, in in my I was pretty newly married. I think we had a couple of children, or the real small mm-hmm. children at this point. Mm-hmm. And I had returned to the University of Alabama to try to finish up my degree and uh, had been been in the Air Force a couple of years and got back. In fact, I was I was at uh, what well, I can't remember if it was Lowry that was in Denver. Yeah. Uh-huh, Lowry Air Force Base. That, yeah. That's not there anymore. Is that correct? Oh, or, no, I think it's I think it's still there. Yeah. yeah. People what talk about, about it. The, huh? the, is there an area called Aurora? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, Lowry's Aurora. out in Aurora. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I lived there for about a year, uh, training. In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many years ago. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, got out of the Air Force, returned to the university, met some people, some a young couple basically that uh, were really committed Christians and just a delightful couple. My wife actually knew the the, the other person's wife uh, since like high school or something like uh-huh. that. Anyway. Uh, we fell into to discussion. Uh, the mind or the intellect or whatever has always kind of been in, important to me. Maybe maybe too important in a mm-hmm. way. Um, uh, but uh, this guy was smart and he was a Christian. Uh, he was kind of a follower of Francis Schaeffer, and uh, and and he basically introduced me to Schaeffer. And anyway, so just through a process, you know, maybe of attrition, I eventually had to give in. You know, it was so compelling. Again, just always hammering me with Romans 9 and the sovereignty of God there and, the, you know, the depravity of, of all yeah. people, et cetera. It was just like, well, if this is the truth, I don't care who it, you know, um, disturbs. Uh, I, I need to embrace it. And, 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 you know, teach it, preach it, share it, whatever. Uh-huh. It doesn't matter who it offends. So that's kind of, you know, sort of, I'm sure there was at least a touch of rebellion that was in there as well, you know. Right. Yeah. There's, a, you know, all the weird things that are in the human heart, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so over time, well, it did, and it didn't take that long, we wound up attending the, it was only one PCA church here in Tuscaloosa at that time. And so we started attending with our family and, um, and I eventually finished, majored in uh, religious studies, minored in philosophy. And of course, there's about nothing else you can do than go to seminary. But yeah. I mean, I had, as we put it in the Baptist church, I had felt the call to ministry when I was about 16. So, you know, uh, I struggled and wondered and doubted, you know, between then and the time that I actually went off to seminary. But but my wife told me she knew she would always ma- marry a minister or a pastor. <laughs> so uh, anyway, my wife freaked out. She, she <laughs> didn't know what to think of this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So anyway, what you know, graduated, and uh, my pastor was a graduate of RTS Reformed Theological Seminary uh-huh. in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. So in fact, uh, Baxter and I were there at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah. But he was like, even though he's younger than me, age wise, he was like a senior when I started. Uh I don't remember him. He doesn't remember me. We we had, uh, you know, a couple of conversations on the phone. But uh, but anyway, uh, so, yeah, after that, uh, got called to First Presbyterian Church of Utah, Alabama. It's (laughs) E-U-T-A-W. And uh didn't know there was a Utah, Alabama. I, I don't think I did either. Until, uh, <laughs> even though they're only like 30 miles away from Tuscaloosa, I don't think I'd ever heard of it. But yeah, you know, it's a county seat. Uh, the little town is a county seat. And it, it goes back like it has a fascinating history. It goes back like to Nathaniel Green, who was a bodyguard for George Washington, got this land grant here in Alabama. Uh, and came yeah. 
started and it's called Green County. And so it's really old, old South, old money, uh, you know, uh, old, in fact, the church that I preached in every Sunday was built before the Civil War. And wow. Really, really quite a quite a church, you know, but uh, had a slave galley at the back at the top. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. 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 Gosh, and they and that's what they called it, huh? Yeah. Back in I the day. So. Yeah. Wow. Uh but um uh, so anyway, um <clears throat> the thing for me theologically is that that I you know, I, I basically just preached exegetically the whole time I was there. I remember like preaching through first Corinthians. And uh I had been exposed to the charismatic movement when I was in high school experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit as, mm -hmm. as they put it or we put it mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, uh, and, but had been pretty much talked out of it. Now it's not possible, you know, <laughs> by, by some fellow Baptists, you know, that, that, that's just not right. That couldn't happen <laughs> or whatever. So anyway, at least theologically, I was talked talked out of it, but, uh, but kind of was, kind of was being drawn back, uh, especially through uh, John Wimber. Uh, the vineyard, uh, yeah, you know, his yeah. writings, etc., uh, were appealing to me. And then there were people like Jack Deere who were very knowledgeable, even about you know he wrote a book about what was it called? It was something about the spirit, but it was primarily about Presbyterians who believed in the spirit. <laughs> yeah, I've got that book somewhere here in my yeah. office. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it talks a lot. And about I took a class on John Wimber and met John Wimber when I was at Fuller. And yeah, wow, wow, yeah, that's right. He taught at Fuller, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I guess at least in part. Now I'm, I hadn't really thought about it that much recently, but that was kind of part of my transition, uh, kind of away from. Uh, a cow and, and I just you know and back and reflecting and trying to remember kind of what was my mentality even that in almost the entire 10 years I just don't remember being even though I again I was on the doctrinal purity committee uh, I don't remember being terribly taken up with you know trying to to be Calvinistic or sticking to the five points or ever yeah. preaching on them especially the most offensive ones but uh you know, but I'm sure, yeah, I, I kind of took the the attitude, I think, of Spurgeon, you know, it's like w whatever you're preaching on, that's what you need to preach on. It doesn't matter whether it fits your theology or not. Yeah, yeah. I think you, Spurgeon, at least, though a Calvinist, at least had some sensibilities about that. Uh, but anyway, so, yeah, I preached exegetically and uh, through different books of the Bible over the course of that 10 years. I'm sure I preached topically as well, but just somehow during, during my, my, my transition was glacial. You know, I know, I know that, I, that I know that the issue of eternal hell bothered me. I don't remember it. I don't, I don't remember being completely preoccupied with it, but I remember for instance, like there was a book by a guy named Neil Punt, who uh, I think it was called The Unconditional Gospel. It was published by Erdman's. And I remember buying that book while I was there. And it gave just a very different perspective on, you know, who will get saved and who won't get saved. And it was a much more generous view of, you know, uh, who who would, you know, be saved ultimately in the end kind of thing. I don't even remember if he was really a Reformed or Calvinist himself. But anyway, it's almost like it just... If I, as long as I preached the scripture and stuck with it, you know, in a way it just like it didn't, it didn't matter. But I do remember at least occasionally, uh, well, like I encouraged my congregation to read through, read through the entire Bible in a year. And a lot of people were like, oh, goodness, I, I didn't know this was in the Bible, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. All kinds <laughs> of wild stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. Especially probably the Old Testament. But anyway, uh, but yeah, it's like it's like some something somehow I know was was happening, and and the, the 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 primary mover though in terms of leaving the PCA though apart from the issue the the, the theological issue for me leaving the PCA was uh, the gift of prophecy it really was, um, and uh, not that I practiced the gift or had the gift or anything else but I just 
As a matter of principle and biblical conviction, I became convinced and with the help of Jack Deere, probably especially that, hey, this there's no reason to believe these gifts has ceased, which the Westminster Confession pretty much says, you know. Um, well, uh, so, yeah, let me ask you about that, because yeah. the version of the Westminster Confession that we have in the EPC was the same one that we had in the PCUSA. That didn't and it didn't have anything about the cessation of the gifts. In fact, um, that had if that was a chapter, they had taken it out. So uh, I never associated cessation of gifts with Calvinism until I guess I learned that some Calvinists yeah. said that, which was kind of new to me because <laughs> in the PCUSA, I mean, when I was a kid, yeah, we went to all the charismatic things and I prayed in tongues at my friend Ricky's house. And, right. but it wasn't it, but I never thought of that as, I mean, that's interesting because that was yeah. never, it yeah. was never in the non Calvinistic category. But I, I, I was never really in, I, I as I got older, I, I started thinking systematically. So, you yeah. know, you use those words like Calvinism or whatever. But that's, sure. but that's interesting that, yeah. I mean, in your, that tradition cessa the cessation of gifts is yeah considered calvinistic i think there's just one line in the confession uh, and it talks about god having revealed himself in various and sundry ways in mm -hmm. the past those ways of revealing himself having now ceased you know it's kind of just like a, a but a real yeah We'll say, well, there it is. That's what it says. And yeah. you can't be in the PCA. Of course, the thing is, is that there was definitely latitude about that issue. And I know one of the most prominent pastors we had, his name was Frank Barker uh, at in, at Birmingham, had a huge church in Birmingham, was PCA, a wonderful man uh, that that he believed, you know, in the gifts of the spirit. So it's like, well, he has a big church. We probably need to let him keep believing. That. Right. If, if you have a big church, yeah. That you... right. Exactly. But uh, anyway, uh, but, but I don't, I guess, I don't know if it's ironic, but it's quite different from the issue. The theological issue is the fact that I was, I was asked to um, start ministering in the local county jail. And uh, I honestly did not want to do it as far as just, wanting to do something you know i was a little afraid to be honest and uh yeah, yeah. but uh um green county is a a largely uh african-american population and it definitely comes out i mean it was a massive uh uh place for um plantations there are a lot of old plantation homes in green county so there was a lot of slavery um and uh, so, um, so anyway, kind of long story short, <laughs> I wound up going to the jail, and uh, and and uh, I don't know how long it took. It just didn't seem like it took very long that 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 I fell in love with it. I just loved it. I loved going and sharing with these guys who were who were just by default desperate anyway. Yeah. But, uh, some of them seemed to have really genuine hunger. Uh, and just seemed to be welcoming and gracious toward me. And so I probably had a ministry, for, I can't recall for sure, but it's probably at least a, two or three years. I would go every week and, uh, you know, and and basically have a Bible class discussion and then just sharing and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, challenging them to set certain goals for reading scripture mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But along the way, as part of that, I met a young man who was from Ohio who had been arrested, I guess, in Green County. Uh, had a warrant out for his arrest, and uh, he was uh, he was a college educated guy, and uh, I mean, he was he was uh, African American, but he, for whatever reason, he just uh, he and I seemed to really take together just uh and and he you know received christ into his heart got saved or however you want to describe uh. it accepted the gospel uh in jail uh and uh uh but at some point uh I, I don't recall how long but at some point he got out of jail 
and he needed a place to stay. As he transitioned back, you know, to his home in Ohio, and uh, <clears throat> for whatever reason, I never gave it a second thought to have him come stay with me and my family mm -hmm. in the church manse. You know, that's what we called Baptists call it the pastorium. We called it the manse. Yeah, it was, it was, that's what we call it. That's Presbyterian name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, you know, we lived, we lived in the house that belonged to the church. And uh, I guess I was, it, it, some people thought I should have asked permission to have this, this uh, gentleman come live with us because he was of a different color, probably more than any other reason, yeah. but I didn't. And again, I, it, in fact, it took, it was years later that it just suddenly dawned on me that, you know, that probably had something to do with them firing me around that time what year what year was that then this was uh 1996 i believe right wow. around there 1996 yeah yeah because we we left utah in 97 um and moved here to uh to tuscaloosa and we've been here ever since but uh um yeah um yeah i I, I, I walk, I, I'm almost certain that, I, again, it's been so long ago, but I'm almost certain that, that by this point, he had actually moved out and, and was still living in Utah, but living in a mobile home or something. And his boys, he had two boys that had come down and they were living with him, et cetera. But uh, one night I walked into the, our monthly session meeting and, uh, and the, the very first words that, were spoken to me uh where we want you to know this has nothing to do with racism and i have always been kind of amazed that those are the first words right yeah you would. yeah especially in 1997 yeah absolutely and uh that's just kind of behind the times that that utah you know it, it, yeah progressive, progressive change there is it's kind of slow coming but uh but anyway, uh, so 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 you know, again, I I just thought it was a usual, the typical session meeting, um, and uh, had no idea that they were going to fire me. But uh, um, but I had <clears throat> I had been praying, you know, it's like Lord, please let me let me go somewhere else. I don't want to be here anymore. But yeah, it's like I just never felt uh, direction or anything to do that, or even put, you know, like put my name in, so to speak, in another presbytery or whatever. And uh, so, but uh, as it turns out, I was, I, uh, I was fired that night. Uh, you, you know, of course they, they didn't say you got to move out of your house tonight or anything like that. It was like, you have X number of months, you know, we, we need you to find another church, et cetera. It's time for you to go. Um, but uh, basically I told them, no, that, that's okay. Thank you. But, but I'll be out by the end of the month or something like that. And I really don't, I honestly don't think I've ever felt bitter or resentful about what happened. Yeah. When I walked home that, cause I was just like a block from my home. It, the, the church is like practically downtown in the little, little mm -hmm. town. And when I walked home that night, uh, it seemed like it was raining a little bit. I was I was the happiest I had been in months and months. Oh, really? That's oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So, so what? So then what? So what did you do after you left there? Yeah. Well. 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 And then how did you end up at the Rethinking Hell conference? <laughs> uh, I actually, to be clear, I was not at the conference. Oh, okay. I just, I just heard it online. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, well, somewhere around this time, and I can't recall again if it was before I got fired or after, I was driving around down south of town, which is kind of, you know, it was across the tracks uh, in, in the largely black community. And, uh, and I just remember, you know, that, I, I really felt impressed that God was speaking to me, not audibly, but in, into my spirit that, you know, I want you to live here someday and minister. And I said, okay, Lord, but you're going to have to tell my wife. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's the chat. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, 
so then then I think I think I've got the timeline correct, but then I got fired not not that long after that. And uh, <clears throat> so my wife and I are discussing. I can remember we were in in our oldest daughter's bedroom, um, and we were just talking about what what's in the future. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what was said, but I know I said nothing about the possibility of move, moving into the housing project. And uh, she she looked at me and said, "Well, you know, I don't even care if we move down the street into the housing project." <laughs> like, well, honey, I'm glad you're sitting down because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I told her, you know, and uh, we just, uh, you know, it, it was just to to us, it was so such clear divine guidance that it was unmistakable. Wow, and I could move, we could move our family uh, of four four children, you know, from very very small, like probably just a couple of years old up to 16, I think, at that time, and that we could move them into a housing project, uh, pro probably the first white family that had ever lived there uh, in Martin Luther King Jr. Village. And <clears throat> uh, and a, 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 it's kind of like the, 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 the I want to say synchronicity or the coincidence of uh -huh. you being there in the church where your father, you know, was different yeah. or whatever, uh, that um, uh, if I had, I found out when I went to apply for housing at the, at the housing uh, project office, I found out that if I had not been fired, I would have never been able to get onto the list of white people. Yeah. Working. Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> so God's God's like pulling the strings all over the place. So when so what did you do then for employment when once you had moved in there? We had uh, we had a uh, a neurosurgeon that had moved well had built a getaway place who who practiced in Birmingham who had come down to Utah which is which is a great hunting area a lot of hunting clubs in uh, Green County and he had come down there and bought several acres of land uh that that he could cultivate and hunt on and do whatever you know uh, his name was dr finley mccray and uh uh he he started he and his wife started coming to our church uh when they were when they were in town they would come and they they just kind of they kind of took to me for some reason and they they were very charismatic they, you know, they were, they were all into that, especially as white. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but they took to us and we took to them and we were just, we just loved each other and cared for each other. And I, and I let Finley know kind of like even the night I got fired, I'm sure I called him that night and told him what had happened. And, uh, but they were kind of like, basically, don't worry about it. You know, you'll be taken care of. So, we founded a ministry called a Harvest Green Ministries because of green, again, is Green County. Harvest Green Ministries, uh, almost immediately, you know, uh, we we got our 501c3 and started this ministry. And, of course, Dr. McRae uh, and Betty, his wife, were, were, were the ones who were primarily funding it. But uh, uh, there, And there were others. I think it seems to me like, maybe even the Presbytery, because I hadn't left the PCA yet mm -hmm. at this point. So I think even the Presbytery con contributed a, a small amount, you know, to, to our ministry. And, and uh, you know, and, and we had some other individuals as well. And so that was, uh, that was how, I mean, and we, we always had plenty. Wow. Yeah. So, how, so, and what, what, when you say, yeah, the ministry there, what, what did you do? What, what kind of, work did you do we primarily we primarily ministered to the children in, in the project and we would have like a bible club in our living room and that kind of thing and we bought a van an old used van that we could carry them on field trips and to, uh, um, and, and and there was another uh black brother in town who was a pastor who had who had a ministry to children in the old theater downtown and they would meet every week um and uh so we started you know helping with that and 
uh, you know, so those were primarily the things that we would do just to get oh, that's, that's to great. love on them and, and uh, share the good news of Jesus with them. And yeah, it, it really was. Uh, wow. It, it, my wife, I, I'm sure would, would agree that, that, that almost certainly was the best year of our lives that we, we spent there. But the thing is we only spent, it may have been a year and three months or something like that, but we didn't last. And my mistake at least I guess it was my mistake, sure seems like one, was for some reason I got it in my mind and probably never got really clear guidance on it, but I got it in my mind that I needed to start a church, and that was a huge mistake because the first thing that we did was we attracted, and I don't mean to be (laughs) disrespectful, but we attracted some older white women who could hear God talk and oh, they yeah. heard God say things different than what I heard God heard yeah. God say, and, you know, God, we need to do this or we need to do that. And, and it's like, it just, it killed me. I mean, in some way, spiritually it killed me. And, yeah. Well, you know, my wife, um, Susan has a pretty strong prophetic gift. I mean, it's really amazed me at times and, yeah. What's so great about it is she's she's not a church lady. She's, so she, you know, yeah. I, I asked her out because she was just cute. She had these white polyester pants, and God spoke to me through the white polyester pants in high school. Right. But the but the thing that uh, I guess what took me a while to learn, I'm sorry, I'm turning my phone down. Sure. You know, I think when I was younger, that prophetic gift, when you encounter the real thing, it's so shocking. Yeah. And then... And then you tend to believe everybody that comes along and says they have a message from God. Right. And boy, I remember as a young pastor, that just about killed me too. And when then I had to realize people could get a message from God and be pro prophetic, but they could also just be wrong and, you know, Absolutely. invent stuff. And gosh, it's, it's that, you know, when scripture says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, I think it's talking about false prophecy because it just like, yeah, it's brutal when, yeah. People do that. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that, and then, and then it's no, well, and, it, and I always think, well, it's no wonder that, you know, there are major groups that are cessationist because going around saying yeah. God said when he didn't say is really dangerous True. business. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that to me is the, the slippery slope of the spirit. It's like mm-hmm. the spirit, you know, trying to walk in the spirit and, uh, you know, the spirit as opposed to the letter, especially that dichotomy that Paul gets into in Second Corinthians, that uh, this is an this is the way of freedom, but with freedom comes responsibility, you know. Yeah, and you it, gotta give people vital. permission to ask questions and test yeah. everything. And yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Well, sorry for that pain. <laughs> <laughs> I I know that pain. I, I you know. Um, sure. Yeah. So we. You know, we left and and moved in with my parents for a while. They they live in a little town mm-hmm. called Gordo, Alabama, kind of an unusual name. But uh, or or lived. My both my parents are deceased now. But uh, and but anyway, I again, it was just totally God's providence and faithfulness. I uh, was having lunch with an old friend one day. I mean, he several years years my senior uh, and kind of a mentor to me. Uh, and, and a stranger walks in the door of the restaurant and and my friend speaks to him and says, hey, buddy, don't y'all need somebody over there at the university to help, you know, with your computers? Because I'd, I'd sort of taught myself computer programming at this at this point, at least the fundamentals of it. Uh-huh. And wrote, actually wrote and marketed a program for sermon development, but which didn't do very well. But uh, but anyway, so so his name was Buddy, Buddy Gertz. And Buddy said, sure, yeah, come on, you know, come over. We'll interview you. We need a DBA. And I, it's like, I'm thinking to myself, I have no idea what a DBA is, but I'll go, I'll go for the interview. So I went and uh, they hired me, you know, on trial. Uh, and, you know, they knew that I didn't know apart from what I had studied uh-huh. up before the interview. Uh, but anyway, I stayed there for over six years and, and left voluntarily. I wasn't fired. So that was kind of the, the place where I really, really learned on the job uh, about computer programming. 
and then I worked at the university for seven years, and then I left thinking I was had another computer I, uh, program idea that I was going to make uh, all the money in the world on, and then totally lost my shirt. And then, you know, eventually wound up now back at the university and hope to retire in uh, May. Yeah. It, it won't be full retirement. Yeah. I won't, will, will not have been there 20 years total, but I be there a little over 11, which, which is, you know, if you're old enough, you can at least get a partial retirement. So I'm really looking forward to that very, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. Cause I hope wow. the doors of ministry, you know, might open. I mean, I would love to be a pastor again, but I'm never going to try to make myself be a pastor. I'm not going to. Yeah. I, I feel that. like God kind of tricked me into being a pastor and, <laughs> You know, yeah. well, I i mean, I love the idea of talking to people and people liking me <laughs> and I love to be able to talk about God. But yeah. I remember when I told my dad that I wanted to go to seminary, you know, he had always said to me, hey, Peter, we, you know, uh, all I have is yours and what you 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 know, you go to school and we'll find a way to pay for it. And right. of course, yeah, that invo- when your pastor's family, that involves a lot of student loans and that kind of stuff. Sure. Sure. But I remember when I went to, when I told him, dad, I think I want to go to seminary. He, the first thing he looked at me and said, well, how are you going to pay for that? <laughs> and, and, and I, and like, I was kind of shocked <laughs> that, you know, my dad, I realized my dad was like, I don't want you to hurt like this, Peter, you Absolutely. know? And my dad was yeah. exactly the same way. He would never encourage me. It's like he had been through too much pain. Uh, yeah. So my son now is getting his PhD and, geology and it's like thrilling for me because i'm kind of living you know vicariously through him so i'm really glad that you know i think god has shown me all sorts of wonderful things and being a pastor is great but yeah but oh gosh it's brutal too yeah so yeah definitely yeah so talking talking being able to think about jesus and talk about jesus i have to stop and remind myself oh this is so great but then the like but the running a church part of it, ah, uh, just that's a nightmare. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I shouldn't say it's a. Well, it's just the. It, yeah, trying to get a group of people to do things is that's challenging. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had my socks blessed off, but then mm-hmm. also experienced so much of the pain that sure. you know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, well, I need to get going probably yeah, pretty soon. Yeah. I got a few more appointments, but um, it's great to just um, talk a bit, Wayne. So you too, Peter. Thank yeah. you so much for taking the time. And I really, do, really do hope we can do it again. I have yeah. a few other questions I'd love to ask you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. That'd be great. So uh, yeah, let's do it sometime. Okay. Very good. So-